All right, let's get into Acts chapter 12. We have really, man, it feels like um, we've been on a freight train, so to speak, just driving forward of the gospel advancing into really what we saw as a promise in Acts chapter 1, that the gospel, the kingdom would be advanced in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the outermost parts of the world. We've been seeing that. We see the kingdom happening. We see men preaching the word. We see the gospel infiltrating people's lives. And and I, I still go back to, I think it's Acts chapter 9, when the gospel is going forward to Samaria. It says that much joy filled the city. And that's my prayer for us as Christ followers, that we'd be a marked people of joy, of the gospel advancing. And we're going to continue to see the gospel advance on Camano, Stanwood, and the outermost parts of the world. That's kind of that's our little bit of our mantra around here, that we'd see people have joy from knowing Jesus. We get to Acts chapter 12, and it's like Luke takes just a small pause to just kind of talk some stories. And Luke loves to do that. He loves to cycle in and out narrative and preaching and narrative and preach. So this is one of those moments we're going to look at this unbelievable story, what happens to Peter And one of the things that we're going to be really thrusting into is prayer and prayer amongst the early church and how that impacts us today, how we pray as the church. So go to Acts chapter 12, and I want you to go to verse 1 with me, and we're going to do quite a bit of reading. We're just really going to hone in on Acts 12. I'm reading from the ESV version. If you've got a tablet or phone, you want to jump there, verse 1. About that time... Herod the king laid violent hands on some who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. And when he had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out to the people. Now watch this, verse 5. So Peter was kept in prison... But earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. What you begin to see in this first century church is they have leaders that, for the most part, they're the tip of the spear. Peter was one of those guys. Saul, we call Paul, was one of those guys. Philip, they were out, they were preaching, they were evangelizing. They were going to areas around the world, so to speak, the outermost parts from Jerusalem. They were the tip of the spear, and they were going in and preaching the wild, unbelievable gospel that they, people, deserve death, but Christ came to save them from their sins by his death, and that we can have life by his resurrection. This gospel is going forward that Jesus is God, and people's lives are changed, and now one of their head dudes is in prison, and what you see here is an earnest prayer of the church. Here's what I love when I read Acts chapter 12. What it doesn't say is, so Peter was kept in prison, but earnest subcommittees were formed for him. I love committees. No, I'm just kidding. But hey, they didn't get together and figure out a strategy plan. They didn't get a group of people and said, well, let's meet every Tuesday from the hours of six and eight o'clock, and we'll we're kind of figure out how to get Peter. No, what they did is they, amongst the community of believers, had such a compassion and a heart for those that were in their flock that they went to prayer first. That they had a desire and a care for one another that brought them to their knees to say the first thing that we will do is not strategize, not come up with a plan, but we're going to pray for our people who are in prison. Because the fact of the matter is, when someone in here hurts, the rest of us hurt. When you've lost a family member and you are at your wit's end, we feel for you in the midst of your loss. When you have someone in your family that dies of cancer, when you have someone that graduates high school, we celebrate with you. When you have a child, we come alongside and we celebrate and you're going through the midst of divorce. We want to be there for you as well. When you hurt, we hurt. When you celebrate, we celebrate. And that's the power of the community of believers to have care and love and compassion for another that leads them to prayer. I remember in the early days of my ministry, I'm in my early 20s, and I thought that what ministry looked like 
was for me to be the next evangelist to put on the big dog and pony show lights and sound and music and all this stuff and I, we were going to draw all these kids and I had no thought or concern about the real lives of our, ste- of our teenagers. So my idea was to come be the celebrity guy, yell, scream, loud, 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 have the music program. And then when I started to realize early in my ministry is that the students that were showing up on Wednesday nights and Sunday mornings were not just another number and a little check count that I had to make sure that we're doing ministry good. They just weren't a bunch of butts and seats. They were real souls, real lives, real students with real problems, with real family lives, with real pain at school. And God was jacking up my worldview of what ministry looked like because, yes, God has called me to preach the gospel, but not just to a bunch of people to say I'm more successful and there's more people in this place, but to preach the gospel to people with real hearts, real lives, and real situations. And what God began to do was to use prayer in changing my outlook on those around me. To see that God deeply cared for people and individuals. That God loves you. And we must have a care for each other. God was changing my heart. Now let's keep going a little bit. Let's go to Acts chapter 12. Let's go to verse 6. Now when Herod was about to bring him out on that, on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains. And centuries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him. And a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side, which I just think is really funny that all the times we've seen angels show up in jail cells with guys in prison, they always say they struck them. I just think that's such a guy thing. Like, get up. Like, I I love that the angel's like, sweet child, hither waketh forth. No, it's like, bam! Like, I just think that's such a guy thing. I'm kind of getting over men's retreat. We had such a good time last two days. And so, like, I love that the angel punches him. All right, he... Hit him on the side, woke him, saying, get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands, and the angel said to him, dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so, and he said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. He went out and followed him. He did not know what was being done by the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. When they had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city. It opened for them of its own accord, and they went out and went along. uh, went along one street and immediately the angel left him. Then when Peter came to himself, he said, Now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all that the Jewish people were expecting. In the midst of the community praying for Peter, the Lord chose in his grace and his kindness and his mercy to answer his prayer and send an angel to wake up Peter, smack, get out, opens the doors, and Peter goes, Whoa, this thing was real. I thought I was dreaming, so to speak. And I love the unbelievable stories that happen when people lay down their life and they begin praying together, asking God to move. Going back to the student ministry years, I'm reminded of when I was around maybe 24, 25. We noticed in the particular city that we were living in, there were a lot of things happening in the school district, especially with kiddos. And one of the things we began to see with middle schoolers, high schoolers, and even fifth and sixth graders were these monstrous things that were taking place in our life. And the schools were, to be honest, very overwhelmed by them. The rate of suicide was climbing through the roof. How many girls were going through abortions was unbelievable. Homelessness was abounding in students, kids that would literally go to school during the daytime and eat as much as they could on the free breakfast and lunch program because they knew that they were going to walk home and sleep in a truck and hopefully nothing bad would happen to them and they would show back up to school the next day. At one point in time, the third largest language in Midland, Texas, after English and Spanish, was Vietnamese. We had many immigrants coming into the Permian Basin for lots of different reasons, but realizing that we had a lot of people in our own backyard and in our school districts that were hurting. So my supervisor's name was Neil, began to gather with us in the student ministry department and said, we're, 
we're going to go into a new project called the, Goth, the, the, the Jericho Project. And what we're going to begin to do is we're going to reach out to principals and we're just going to prayer walk their school. And so we're, we're not going to try to be invasive. We, we just want them to know that Stonegate Fellowship is going to be praying for their schools. So we would contact principals and, hey, I'm Jeff Turner. I'm the high school pastor. And uh, if it's okay with you, we're, we won't be on your property. We're just going to walk the city block. But you just need to know that Stonegate's praying for you. And it was unbelievable how many principals came back and said, thank you so much for your prayers. And so that first week, I remember getting out there with a fire in my belly, walking around Abel Junior High, walking around Lee Freshman, praying, just going, all right, God, we're going to do something. This is going to be great. I'm, just, I'm just fired up, right? Yeah, week three wasn't as much. I realize I'm walking four miles a day. This weird guy walking around, I feel like a creep. It's like, okay, I'm here, I'm, I'm praying. And after week three and week four, I just started going, God, what are you doing? I mean, okay, we're out here and I'm sweating, <laughs> it's hot, and I'm walking more than I ever do in my whole life. And it took time. What we began to see is after month two, month three, and month four, just praying around these schools, the schools started contacting us said, hey, what would you think about having some assemblies with our students? We're like, uh, we would love that. Start bringing in speakers, being available at these schools, high-fiving students that we would have never seen. We, we, we got to invite them to our church. And we had now students showing up in the droves that I've never met before. And what started to happen, because of prayer, we started to see unbelievable things happen in which, number one, God was preparing our hearts for something. He was preparing the landscape for gospel to go forward in these kids' lives. But honestly, the biggest thing for me was God was changing my heart. Because if I could just be honest, like most of us think, especially those in ministry, our idea towards going to people is usually, well, you know what? People know our service times. They can show up if they want to. Well, if they really want to be here, they'll come here. And we sort of have this backwards idea of the gospel that is such that, well, you know what? I, I could be going out there, but that's kind of an inconvenience. I'm kind of nervous. I don't know how to talk to people. So if people really want the truth, then they'll come in here. And that is so different than what the commission, the great commission that God gave us through Christ when it says this, go therefore and make disciples in all nations. And what God was doing was changing my heart from having some just cold idea of what ministry was. That, well, if they just want to come here, they'll find, the, they'll find it where they want to. To say, no, I've got to go where they are. I've got to meet people where they are. And this wasn't just a mandate for the pastors and the apostles. This great commission is a mandate for all of us in Christ. Instead of seeing myself sitting in church in my little insular area, oh, I hope this thing doesn't get too big. I still like the family feel. I often think, what would you have felt like the first day you showed up at Commando Chapel if someone would have said to you, well, we don't want to get too big around here? You would have walked away. And I get, yes, I love the family feel. I love walking in, being able to know most of your names and walking the heritage service. And, but can I tell you something? I know what it was like to walk in those first days as a seventh grader in First Baptist Snyder, not knowing a soul and someone grabbing a hold of me and saying, hey, aren't you friends with so-and-so? And, oh, it's good to meet you. Oh, my goodness. And through prayer, God was changing my heart. My prayer is for you is that God would be changing your heart as well. That someone would walk through those doors and they would be immediately met with family. Because I'm telling you, people are going to walk through those doors and it was hell just to get here this morning. Someone that's never been to church, there is already a distinctive lens that says, I don't know if I want to be there. They don't, they don't know my story. And it's a fight just to get out the door. And for them to walk in those doors and to sit here alone, no one talking to them, is the, one of the worst feelings you can have when you walk into a place that you've heard is supposed to be a place of love, and it didn't feel very loving. 
My prayer is, is that we would have our hearts and minds changed to see unbelievable things happen. I'll never forget when we were opening a church in Odessa, Texas, and one of the things that we did is we bought a bar and transformed into a church. It's really cool. I actually remember opening up one of the doors and just seeing liquor. And so we made a joke to our congregation that we're trying to raise funds. So if you want to come by, so it was a bad joke. But anyways, so we, uh, <clears throat> we started praying on that very premise. It was called Graham Central Station. And they're, they're still a church to this st- still day. They're, they're, they're running and doing great. And we began to pray and say, God, as people were showing up to find community in wickedness, Our prayer is that people would find community in Christ here. So before we opened, we revamped the building. We had a 24-hour prayer deal over a weekend. We started on Friday and went through Sunday morning before we opened our first service. And we prayed on the hour, every hour. And we had people come in. They would come at 2 o'clock in the morning. The last person off would say, hey, just to let you know, uh, the last place I read was Psalm 36. And so if you'll just start reading and pray the whole time, we're going to pray that people would show up in this this building, that we would be a lighthouse to Odessa, Texas, to reach people with the gospel. You know what happened Sunday morning? People showed up that we had never met before. People that probably went, I just, and actually what's really funny is most people just showed up because they wanted to see what the bar looked like now. Right? Y'all still have the dance floor, the honky-tonk music? You know, and had they walked in and we said, um, we, we want to keep this thing kind of a small family, you kind of don't look like our top. Oh, you're just here to see? No, we, we said, we're so glad you're here. Why? Because God was changing our hearts. One of the most unbelievable pieces of this story, one of the most unbelievable pieces that can happen in your life is when you begin to pray that God would change your heart to see people the way God sees them. That you're sitting next to somebody here on, in, in, in Commando Chapel, that God would change your heart to say, I have never reached out to this person before. I'm just going to introduce myself to let them know that they are family in the house of God. That my heart would be changed. Now let's keep going a little bit. Let's go to verse 12. When he realized, this is Peter, when Peter realized this, he went to the house of Mary. So Peter's out of prison. He goes to the house of Mary the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. So they're they're continuing to pray. They think Peter's still in prison. Verse 13, and when he knocked at the door, I love this. This is so funny. So he knocks at the door of the gateway. A servant girl named Rhoda came to answer, recognizing Peter's voice. In her joy, she did not open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. I just love this because this would be like one of my kids. Like, Hear me outside knocking. And I don't know if Peter was talking to himself or praying out loud. And the girl goes, it's Peter. And so instead of opening the door, she just runs away. You know, like Peter's like, hello, you know, that sort of thing. So she runs back, verse 14, uh, verse 15. They said to her, you're out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so. And they kept saying, it's his angel. Which I'm thinking, if I'm in the prayer group and a little girl shows up and says, Peter's outside. And one of the guys in the group says, it's just his angel. I'm like, can we tell him out? I want to see that. So anyways, why they stayed, whatever. Peter continued knocking. And when they opened, they saw him and were amazed. But motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, tell these things to James and the brothers. And then he departed and went to another place. What you saw happen amongst the early church praying for Peter is that they had on their hearts a very specific request. Because the group's going, hey, Peter's locked in a Roman prison. There are centuries, there are guards. We can't just sort of sneak out and get him out of there. They didn't take care of their prisoners very well. Peter probably went without food for a long time. So what was their big, hairy, audacious goal? What was their BHAG? It was to pray to get Peter out of prison. And God answered that prayer. We talked at the men's retreat, and we're out this way. And I said, instead of be hags, maybe we should start having be haps. Big, hairy, audacious prayers. Prayers that we would say to God, 
I'm believing in this big, massive thing that I have no idea how it will happen. I don't know how we're going to fund it. I don't know how the people are going to get signed up for it. But this has to happen. How many of us are praying that big? But if, if I were to be really honest with you, I don't know how many of us are actually praying that big. Because I think it comes back to the size and the view of the God we're praying to. Do I believe that God is big enough to handle those kind of prayers? And do I believe that he has the character of caring for those kind of prayers? Go to Nehemiah for just a moment. I want to take you to chapter 1. Nehemiah chapter 1. I want to read to you one of my most favorite prayers in all the scripture. And we're literally just going to land on one verse. Nehemiah, if you remember, he's in Susa. It's away from Jerusalem. It's where the exiles went. His brothers and his friends show up. They're, having, they're hanging out, having dinner, having soup, whatever it is. And they begin talking. How are things back in Jerusalem? And you go, it's not good, man. Walls are down. Gates are torn to pieces. And it says that Nehemiah wept. He had a compassion and a concern for something bigger than himself. He cared about home. He cared about the place that if they were in modern day era, had a street with kids riding their bikes and their scooters. And you walked across the street and you said, hey, Henry, what's going on? And hey, I got a Coke. Do you want a Diet Coke? And sit there and shoot the breeze. And the wives are talking about their husbands. And it's just laughing and fun. And that's the kind of place that Nehemiah grew up on. He's realizing my home is a wreck. And he tears up over it. Is there something in your soul that's bigger than who you are that you have a passion and a compassion towards that says, God, my heart breaks for that? And are you praying towards that? And here is Nehemiah's prayer, verse 5. And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love Him and keep His commandments... The first thing that Nehemiah prays is he says this, Great and awesome God. Is the God you pray to, is the God when you come into Commando Chapel, when you go to Bible study, when you read your Bible, when you do any particular activity or ministry here on this campus, do you recognize and believe the size and the power and the width and the majesty and the might of the God that you and I serve? Or is he little G God who sits in my pocket whenever I need him, I pull him out whenever it's convenient? Nehemiah believed in a great, mighty God. And then listen to these words that Nehemiah says about the Lord who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him. You and I, when we came to know the Lord, we came to Him first because He drew us to Himself. And when I placed my faith in the Lord, when I said, I trust you, Jesus, I want to be born again, I am yours. It wasn't the size of my faith, it wasn't the intensity of my faith. It wasn't my ability to obey in my faith. It was my faith. And at that moment, what God did was He made an everlasting, unending covenant with me. And the rest of my life, I am His. And He is mine. I grew up with a single mama who worked hard for me and my brother. So I grew up with a very skewed view of what a dad is. It was very temporal. Some days I wondered if he liked me. Other days I didn't know if he did or not. If I saw him in public, I felt like I had to sort of put on the dog and pony show to make him like me or get great grades. Or, and we, we've talked in here amongst us before if some of you have experienced that as well in the home that you grew up with. Like I, I grew up without a dad or I grew up without a mom. And, and so what happens is in early stages of my growth in Christ, I start thinking that in order for God to be happiest with me, I need to do the most for him and put on the dog and pony show so that he will like me. And I'm sitting around a table with my friend Ben Watson when I'm 20, 21 years old, realizing as we're reading the scriptures together that God has demonstrated the fullness of his son 
and that that is the fullest demonstration of God's love towards me. I cannot make God any happier than his fullness of love demonstrated through Christ on the cross. I can grieve him, but the greatest love he has towards me is that he sent his son Jesus to die from where. Therefore, I need you to listen to me, dear child today, who is sitting here, commando child with 11 o'clock service. God loves you through Christ. You are his son. You are his daughter. You have ultimate, unending access to King God. And forever and ever and ever, he keeps his covenant promises towards you. So when you and I pray to God, I do not pray to a God who one day is mad at me, one day is happy, one day has his back towards me. He is not temporal. The same God yesterday is the same God today. And that's how much he loves you. Are you praying big, understanding the might and the majesty of the God that you worship and that you love? That is the dad amongst dads. That is your father. That's why I love that Jesus told us how to pray. And what does it start off with? I may need to be reminded. How does it start off? Oh, our father. That you and I would get to call Yahweh father. That you have the kind of access to the king that peasants don't. If you were living in 1600 England, whatever, and you just had to walk up to the king's doors at 3 in the morning and go, Hey, king! Hey, let's go see because you pay my taxes. You're getting your head cut off. The son or the daughter of the king can show up at 3 o'clock in the morning asking for a glass of water. He will gladly serve his kids. Tim Keller says it like this, you have that kind of access. That I can go to my father and I can pray for big things because I know that he is my father who listens and cares deeply. That I would be involved in seeing the kingdom go forward. How does the kingdom go forward? That I would communicate to as many people as I possibly can that God loves them, demonstrated his love through Jesus, that he wants you into the family. That is the kingdom going forward to see life and the landscape changed by his work. This is also why in the Lord's Prayer it also says this, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I want a t-shirt that says, in the Pacific Northwest as it is in heaven. Wouldn't that be cool? Let's make that shirt and sell it and raise money for missions. How many of that's so cool? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come, your will be done in the Pacific Northwest as it is in heaven. Do you believe in the God that you're praying to that he is that mighty and that caring towards your needs? That you can go to the Father and say, here. And that your Father would go, yes. That is the power of this story. That collectively when we pray together and individually when you pray, you have the Father of the universe listening to you because of Jesus Christ.